And a good football Friday. Or is it? Here on Birds 365, your Mac and Mac guys, John McMahon and Jody McDonald. Johnny Mac had to work into the wee hours of the morning. Yours truly went to bed pretty dejected after last night's Eagles preseason game. We're here to talk about it with you for the next two hours. Mr. McMullen, what time did the head hit the pillow? Oh, boy. I wasn't expecting that. I got I, I to gotta think. Three? Three, maybe? Oh, Three-ish? Man. Certainly in that range. Been there, done that. After two, turn around, get up to Bird Street 65 and give you... I give you props for being a gamer. I don't know how many Philadelphia Eagles I can say that about this morning, but I'll give those props to you. Uh, this is an old and overused phrase, but I'm going to use it because it's very fitting. Eagles lose 35 to nothing, and the, the final score was not indicative to the actual closeness of the game. It was worse than that. It should have been worse than that. That if the Patriots had somebody could kick it through the uprights, it would have been worse oh, yeah. than that. You're right. Holy I mean, mackerel, Johnny Mac. What the hell happened last night? What do we have? A 36-yard missed field goal, two missed extra points. Remember, they went for a two-point conversion because the kicker would couldn't make an extra point. So that's six points right there. You tack on. You have, to, you have any competency at the place kicking position. So yeah, they got they got boat race. Uh, and it is preseason, and I and I want to point that out. And obviously, the the starters, uh, a lot of the starters didn't play, and those that did play, very quick cameo appearance. So I I kind of look at this more of a, a perspective of, of preparation, and what the heck are you doing to prepare for the, for September twelfth against the Atlanta Falcons? That's what I'm concerned about because I don't get the plan. I don't get what was going on. Now, Jalen Hurts aside, because obviously that's not the head coach's fault or anybody. You get sick, you get sick, you got to go to the hospital. Jalen's a tough guy. I got to imagine it was pretty bad. It was a little bit strange because he was out there pregame. He's just dancing around. Everybody saw him. He looked completely fine. And then we fast forward to the game, and Joe Flacco's under center. Uh, so, you know, that's a – that's a big adjustment. Uh, now that said, that's a veteran quarterback who's been out there. That's not going to phase him. Certainly in preseason, Joe Flacco. Um, so I, I still look to more of the plan. And oh, by the way, if Jalen Hurts was healthy, he was going to be out there to for two series. That's it for two series. And you know, he's not the starting quarterback, Jody. <laughs> uh, we won't admit that. Look. I I've, I've been I've seen a lot of positive signs from Nick Sirianni. I think I've been pretty optimistic throughout the early process of camp, willing to give him the benefit of the doubt when it comes to short practices, which by the way isn't even his decision. That's coming from uh Howie Roseman, the medical staff, the training staff. Um now I'm starting to question, you know, what what the heck is the plan here? And I think the plan, and he keeps saying, keeps defaulting to Nobody knows what we're going to do uh, as far as offensive, defensive scheme, and they don't want to show anything, and they're not showing anything in preseason. So, I mean, the Eagles are probably number one in the category, of, you know, let's get rid of these games. If coaches are going to be this just, uh, you know, we talk about tanking late in the season. If you're going to charge regular price for fans for these games and coaches around this league are going to be this disdainful of this process, let's just get rid of these stinking things. Let, let me let me jump in here. I, I heard everything you said, including at the <laughs> end, that the Eagles are not showing anything. Just No one can take anything of what the Philadelphia Eagles are going to be from our two preseason games so far. Don't you think the guy on the other sideline, who some would argue is – the greatest coach of all time, if he's doing the same thing, oh, my God, this might be the greatest football team ever. If the New England Patriots are keeping things under wraps and a boat race, to use your phrase, the Eagles the way that they did, how great are the Patriots going to be? Yeah, if it's wow. all about don't show anything, don't let anybody know what you're doing, oh, my God, the New England Patriots are going to be the greatest of all time. Cam Newton, the check down yeah. king, threw the ball pretty damn well last night. Mac Jones, rookie, wet behind the ears, kid. Wide open, wide receivers delivering the football with zing on it. How come the Patriots were able to do that and the Eagles weren't? Yeah, that's a good point. 
It's a good point. And we talked about, and I'm one of those, I thought the Eagles outplayed the Patriots in joint practices. And then all of a sudden the lights go on and the Eagles look like the worst team in the world and the Patriots look like the Tom Brady Patriots. Um, uh, you know, I, I always go back to two coaches who have the two philosophies I always point to. Marv Levy in Buffalo would always say, didn't care a lick about preseason. And when the Bills were great with Jim Kelly and Thurman Thomas and all those guys and Bruce Smith, you know, he would say he would use the preseason to find three guys at the back end of the roster that can help his team. That was it. That was the whole plan. And they barely ever won a preseason game through that whole run, uh, if you go back and look. Uh, I, my first coach I ever covered is Dennis Green. He he had the theory of winning as a habit. And, you know, he didn't go out of his way. It's not like he was playing Randy Moss and Chris Carter any more than anybody else plays the starter. But if you're in the game, if you're dressed up, you try to win the game. Um, you know, obviously Nick Sirianni is more of, I would think, uh, the Marv Levy category. So both can work. Um, and, and I get the thought process behind both. And I always tell people, I always tell Sixers process people mainly, there is always more than one way to do something. Always, always, always more than one way. So I'm not saying this can't succeed in the regular season. And that's why I look at the plan. That's my biggest concern. That's what I'm, I can't figure out for the life of me, the plan. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna sit your starters, sit your starters. If if, if you know what, what you play your back seven uh, beside Darius Slay with no defensive linemen that were available on the offensive line, you play two guys but not three guys. Uh, on, at wide receiver, which by the way I agree with. They get reps for the young receivers, Devontae Smith, Jalen Rager, Quez Watkins, because, oh, by the way, you saw last night, they need them, and they need them badly. Uh, and they play to the end of the first half with all the mismatch of – so my, my larger point is you're supposed to be developing chemistry, not only on an individual basis. We always talk about with the quarterbacks and the receivers. you got to play together. Eric Wilson – it has got to, you know, it'd be nice if he could get his series or two with, you know, Fletcher Cox if he's healthy and Brandon Graham if he's healthy, which they were. Um, it'd be nice to see Jordan Mailata and Isaac Sayamalo out there with Lane Johnson, Brandon Brooks, who, by the way, were ready to play. They were dressed, and they just changed their mind at the last minute because, oh, Jalen Hurts isn't playing, so let's sit Lane and Bra What the – where is the – where is the structure – where is the structure? That's what NFL coaches always talk about. You know, a, a structure, discipline, have a plan. Not fly by the seat of your pants. Okay, I mean, you, you, you had some adversity. The starting quarterback got sick. Granted, all right, do a better job with it. Let me ask you a question about, and this is what you and I discussed briefly before the show, and is a bigger concern for me than anything else. They sat a lot of their starters. You're right. A couple of starters did play a series. Miles Sanders played four snaps. Is that four, right? He got four two snaps. carries and four snaps. Yeah. Uh, at least they get. Uh, by the way, Miles is not playing week one. You're protecting him. He's out there week two. It, it makes no sense. That's my problem. Here's here's where my issue comes in, Johnny Mac. Um, Nick Sirianni, since day one in that ill-fated opening press conference, uh, which he's gotten better at since by leaps and bounds, um, talked about competition, that he wants the guys not only to compete against the other teams, but in every single snap they take in practice. It's always a competition. It's always the charge to be better, to get better. You stack practices on top of games, on top of downs, and all the little catchphrases that he uses, but it all comes back to competition. He decided to not compete with how many guys, how many guys didn't even play for the Philadelphia Eagles? No, no a couple were it. Jalen Hurts is included in that. And he was off the hospital, get his stomach looked at that. But there were a whole bunch of guys that were healthy that did not play at all. How many guys did they not even dress for last night's game? Uh, there were 20 total. Now, uh, most of those were injured. So if you add in, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it real quick as we're speaking here. 
Darius Slay could have played. Obviously, he was back at practice. So remember, he got banged up at practice with that friendly fire thing, but then he was back. So uh, he technically could have played um, Brandon Graham, um, Jason Kelsey, Lane Johnson, Fletcher Brandon Cox, Brooks, Hargrave. Uh, uh, now, Hargrave was hurt. Hargrave has an ankle injury. Uh, Fletcher Cox. Uh, so six guys, Josh Sweat, seven guys uh, were healthy and could have played. The rest of them were injured. Uh, Barnett did have... Barnett did Barnett suit up and play last night or no? No, he he's got a shoulder injury. Okay. He didn't play. Yeah. So they didn't. Uh, defensive line, they didn't. They didn't have anybody. They didn't play. Graham and Cox and Sweat were healthy. Uh, Sweat and Javon Hargrave and Ryan Kerrigan were not. So that's your top six defensive linemen. Um, they didn't play the three that could have played. So when you start talking about there was no pass rush, Milton Williams had a couple. That was it. Uh, they were but really, Let me, let really me ask you a question about the hurt guys. Was, was Kayvon Wallace 100% healthy last night? Well, that's, that's, that's a good question. He, he came back really quickly from the groin injury, called right. himself Wolverine. Then he got hurt with a groin. So he right. left the game. He was in the, the medical tent. So. Right. So he some guys played who fight. were uh, hurt right up until yesterday, and they went out there and took a shot, while others who, uh, if it were a regular season game, I'm guessing would have able, been able to play through the injuries they had. They said, no, 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 we're not going to take a chance. We're not going to let them play. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have a problem with that. With veteran players who are even a little bit dinged up, like I don't have a problem with not playing them. That that makes sense to me in the preseason. In the case of Kayvon Wallace, you know, he's probably watching Marcus Epps playing better than him, and he's like, I got to get it on the field quicker. That's probably, you know, you probably criticize the training staff, the medical staff. They probably got to slow the kid down, uh, and then he re-injures the groin. So there's a lot of layers to that. But, you know, the guys like Hargrave and Barnett, yeah, you're probably right. I, I, I can't say with 100%. If it's a regular season game, they probably try to go. Uh, depending on – they're both listed as day-to-day, -day, so it's not a week-to-week -week injury. Um, but I don't have any problem with holding those guys up because they haven't been practicing. Here, um, here's the thing I'm trying to get at, Johnny, and I uh, apologize for interrupting, uh, but we got to get a break because uh, Derek Gunn's going to join us coming up here in just a couple of minutes uh, early in today's show. Who's deciding who is and isn't playing? Is it more the medical staff than the coaching staff? Is it more the medical staff and Howie Roseman than the players and the coaching staff? Is Howie Roseman just drawing up a list before the game starts and handed it to the coach and go, these guys play these? And, and in parentheses is the number of plays I want them to play. Who's making this call? Is it Nick Sirianni? Is it Howie Roseman? Is it a... A combination of the coaching staff along with the general manager. Maybe there's other personnel people in Howie's office that are actually giving him advice as to how much to play and who to play. And they try to get Sirianni on the record about it afterwards, and he's become a pretty good coach. He's pretty damn evasive of that question pretty quickly. Your best guess, who's deciding? <clears throat> who, my who bet, played my... <laughs> question is 35 to nothing lost. You know, it was interesting because Nick got asked this during training camp, not last night. And that's the closest I've seen him yet go to being a little bit upset. I'm not going to say upset, Mr. Abullion, but uh, I think it was Jeff McClain who phrased it as, um, so you just listen to the medical and training staff. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, at the end of the day, I listen to their advice and it's my decision. Bottom line, if you're, you're going to ask me what the truth is. No, the, the organizational, it, the, the short practices, the holding guys out, that's an organizational decision. Uh, and that's led by, by Howie Roseman. Um, is that good? Is that bad? Uh, you can make arguments of both ways. Like I said, I, I'm 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 very honest about preseason football. I don't think it's meaningful for players like Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham and Jason Kelsey and Lane Johnson and Brandon Brooks. So I don't have a problem with it. I have a problem with the the herky jerky nature of this guy's out, this guy plays. You know, there are a couple teams that that set out. 
35 and up to, I think 37 was the high water mark. Two teams were over 35. They, I think they both got killed in preseason week one. They, they're not even playing their, their high level reserves. So, like, I get that though. I get you're not playing anybody. Like, I get the consistency of it. I don't get throwing the back seven out there, but not the front four. I don't get throwing half of the offensive line out there, but not the other half. I, that is the part where I I think the plan is I I don't I don't know what adjective you want to use fragmented I I don't see where you gain chemistry with with Jordan Mailata say and Isaac Sayamala without the rest of the offensive line out there I don't see where the back seven is helped by playing with second and third string uh, defensive linemen so set them all set them all. Here's one of uh, here's two narratives that I think need to be put aside. If not put the rest, at least put aside. The Eagles have good depth. <laughs> really? Their depth <laughs> nobody, was out there nobody. on the field last night and they got torched and shredded. So please stop with the Eagles have good yeah. depth. And the other one is it's going to be really difficult to cut this roster down to 53. <laughs> no, it's not. Give me a pen. I'll start scratching off names after last night's debacle. I think it's yeah, going to be pretty right. easy to cut this down to. 50 well, points. I would I would say that of any NFL fan base, you don't have depth. <laughs> you think you might think you do. You don't. No, not even close. All right, he's John McMullen. I'm Jody McDonald. Uh, going to get a guest up early today. Derek Gunn's going to join us. He's got uh, a charity golf affair. He's got to get to. So he said, "Oh, I'll hop on with the guys, but I got to get out relatively early." So we're going to get him up early, get him out early. Derek Gunn joins us next here on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life. Count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. 
It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. A football Friday, thanks for football Friday edition of Birds 365 with your Mac and Mac guys. John McMullen, Jody McDonald here with you. Hoping to be joined by Derek Gunn shortly, the host of the Eagles live post game show here up on the Jacob Media channel, YouTube channel, which you were part of last night, J Mac. You're going to be part yeah, of the post game show. I, too? I was on, I was on late uh, with Devin. It's, it's uh, Derek Gunn, Devin Caney, and Mark Barzetta, obviously. So, you know, and uh, Lane Johnson as well. And Lane, by the way, was not happy, wasn't yeah. even a part of this. Uh, he was not happy, so everybody can check out uh, his reaction on the Jacob Media YouTube page and uh, my reaction as well with 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 those guys and 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 Gal Devin's doing a great job as well. Um, look, it was it's hard to spin that in a positive direction. O- other than it doesn't matter, so you turn the page and you move on to this week. My biggest concern as we wait for Derek Gunn to pop on here, Jody is. You know, we're getting those early indications that the Eagles are playing the Jets next week. You're you're Jets, and they're going to have joint practices in advance. Sure sounds like they're going to place more importance on the joint joint practices, and I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see anybody in that that week three preseason game, which is now the final preseason game, the traditional final preseason game with the Eagles and Jets. So you're going to see a bunch of what you saw last night. Hopefully it's better than 35 nothing. But, you know, I get a kick out of it because it's preseason football. Look, we talk about the Eagles versus 365. I mean, 365, we're on Monday through Friday, but you can always go on the channel, and that's why we call it that because you can always get your Eagles information. We have to react to what's going on, and what's going on is – you know, 35 to nothing, plus you have 17 to nothing in the second half against Pittsburgh. So we got six quarters of football where a rookie head coach has been outscored 52 to nothing. You're the math guy, Jody. Is that correct? That's bad math. Anyway, you slice it, that is very bad math for the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, you mentioned trying to put a good spin on things. You're having a tough time doing it. I'm having a tough time doing it. On the Birds Live postgame show last night, Lane Johnson had a tough time doing it. Derek Gunn, you even going to try and do it? Put a good spin on uh, the last six Eagles, last six quarters of Eagles football? Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. 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 But, I, you know, I'll tell you guys this. i tell you guys this because I say this all the time. You know, whenever I'm at Eagles, uh, uh, Eagles practice or football practice, and, you know, you see a lot of people, this guy's spectacular catch. This guy looks really good in practice. I'm like, okay. Okay, they look good. They look good in a, in a controlled environment. But I never get too hyped about practices. You know, games. the games that are telling stories. And I understand, you know, a lot of starters didn't play last night at the last minute once Jalen Hurts was announced not to be played. But you've got to have young men that step up. You know, and I'm not talking about rookies. I'm talking about guys who have been here before as professional athletes. Yes, they're all learning a new system. We get that. But – You're trying to make that 53. You're trying to make that paycheck. If not the 53, then the practice squad. And outside of maybe Alex Singleton, Miles Sanders looked good, limited touches he had. But outside of of Alex Singleton, who really stood out to you guys? Because for me, nobody really. I had to look at it, Deacon, because I do my stock market for Sports Illustrated, the ups and downs. I had plenty of downs, as you know. I talked to you guys on the postgame yep. show. Yep, I was I was looking for ups. I had TJ Edwards. I thought he played well. Uh, almost, you know, I think he's been better in pass coverage than people give him credit for. So I think he was a yep. bit of a surprise. I think Devontae Smith struggled, but the route running was there. That Absolutely. part of it, you, you, you figure he'll start catching the football. But one guy, exhibit A to what you just said about practice versus games, Jalen Rager. We were all raving. I'm there every day. I mean, we can only report what we see. We said the one-handed catch. It was phenomenal. It was OBJ-like. I watched him last night in the game, the route running, exact opposite of Devontae Smith. Just awful. 
And it this was, guy's got to yeah. be the second receiver on this team. It, it's got to be a little bit of a concern. Well, maybe he's not the second receiver. Maybe Quez Watkins emerges as that second receiver. And Jalen uh, slips down to the number three receiver. You know, you, you, you'd like to think that competition breeds competition. You know, Jalen Rager had a tough year in 2020. Okay, uh, Quez Watkins has been the talk of training camp. And then they draft this uh, Dev- Devontae Smith, number one, uh, this year. So if I'm, if I'm Jalen, I'm thinking, okay, I've got to step up my game. I've got to elevate my play to justify me being here, not just as a, as a, as a player, but as a first-round draft pick for this organization. And, you know, outside of the, the time that we found out he got yelled at by Nick Sirianni on August 4th, he had improved. You know, he went out the next day, had a great practice, you know, but a receiver is only as good as the quarterback who gets him the ball. And obviously he only had limited amount of reps, but you're right. I didn't see the separation I wanted to see from him in in certain situations. Devonta Smith, that one move that he had where he did a quick, like a skinny post and then dipped it back to the outside. That's what I expect to see. That's what I was accustomed to seeing from him in Alabama. And if he does that, for this team, it's going to open up a lot of things. But you're right, Jalen Rager has to elevate his game, you know, because I and I've said this on other platforms, including my own gun on one, and I'll say it on your show this morning. I think the starting uh, wideouts are going to be Smith and Quez Watkins, and Jalen Rager moves to the slot position if he continues to approve, which means Greg Ward won't get as many touches. I think the, the slot position is the perfect spot for Greg Ward, but I think Jalen Rager has a little bit better quickness if he utilizes all those assets. But right now, it's not happening for him. Uh, but there's still plenty of time between now and the time they kick the season off for real. Oh, by the way, let me tap into the Derek Gunn line of thinking yeah. and really annoy all legal fans here. Don't um, do it. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do it because facts are facts. And you're right. Practice is great. It's not a game. Tell me what you did in a game against a team right. with another jersey on. Right. Quez Watkins, who everybody loves, has right. one catch. Yeah. One. Yeah. Two games, one catch. 79-yard touchdown. The great catch. Right. He has one in two games. He got the same number of catches as you, me, and Johnny Mack combined last night. That right. would be zero. And, yes, he got behind the defense and hurt over to him by a little bit. That's not a catch. That's an ooh moment that you walk off the field because it's fourth down. Right. We're getting a little crazy about Quez Quez Watkins, who had one catch in two weeks. Again, you're only as good as the amount of balls get thrown your way. For whatever reason, Quez didn't get those balls thrown his way last night. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't have that chemistry, that timing yet with a Joe Flacco. Um, But the one thing that really bothered me was the fact that once it was decided that Jalen Hurts was not going to play, Sirianni decides to pull all of his starters, basically. Uh, on the offense. And, you know, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but there could be a, a point in time when Joe Flacco has to play with his starting um, offense somewhere this season. I, you know, I, I, and I hope Jalen Hurst doesn't get hurt, but Flacco, Flacco needs those game reps to get comfortable with that guy. It's one thing to practice it, but you got to get out there and perfect it in a game situation. This was a perfect scenario, especially since the Patriots left their starters in for a much longer time than I thought they were going to be in. So why not have Flacco play with some of these frontline guys? You know, the Ertzes, the Goddards, the offensive line that was intact. You know, finally, say Amala was out there, could have played. Why not play all these guys? You know, it, it just, even if it was only one series together, just work up a little sweat with these guys. He was out there with twos and threes, and it was a struggle because he was playing against the Patriots frontliners for the most part. But I just thought Sirianni could have used that situation a little bit better than he did. Yeah, I agree, Deacon. We talked about that on the post-game show, and that's what right. I want to piggyback off. The fragmentation, I, the herky-jerkiness of the decisions. You're playing uh, the back seven on defense outside of Darius Slay for a little bit, right. but not the front four. You're playing um, uh, the left side of the offensive line, but not the right side of the offensive line. You're playing the young mm-hmm. receivers who need reps, but you're not – you're not playing the other guys that they need a chemistry with. Everything's right. got to be in concert. So that was my biggest problem. Look, yeah, I said they've been outscored 52 to nothing in six quarters. That's not good. Right. They had their first third down conversion What I think 151 left in the first half. First third down conversion mm-hmm. of the preseason, not yeah. just of last night. Yeah. Um, 
But all of that I can forgive. I can't forgive the plan. And even when the quarterback, and that, as I said on your show, that's not Nick Sirianni's fault, but you got to handle it better. Is that fair to say, or am I overreacting to that? Well, I understand why a lot of coaches, if you look across the, the National Football League, a lot of teams are limiting their frontline guys in preseason games, and understandably so. When you look at the volume of injuries that have occurred in, in, in training camp and preseason games over the last five years, I mean, the Jets just lost uh, one of their prime defensive players in oh, a controlled lost, scrimmage. Man. Yeah, lost in a, in a control scrimmage in Green Bay, ruptures his Achilles. Injuries are going to happen. Um, who, whoever you start with in September, you're not necessarily going to finish the season with that same nucleus of players come January. That's understandable. Um, but I, I just feel that maybe Nick's being a little bit too cautious. Now, as Lane told us last night, they're keeping things very vanilla. You know, they want to have as much of an upper hand against Atlanta when they hit the ground running as possible. I, I get that. You know, and who knows? Nick Sirianni may come out uh, September 12th against the Falcons and call the game of a lifetime that we'll be ecstatic about. But, you know, there's also that possibility it could be a little bit jagged, you know, coming out of the gate. Because if the regulars, and from what I'm told, the regulars are not going to play next week against the Jets. Yeah. From what I'm told, if that's the case, that's over three weeks of not having any game reps with your starting units on the football field. Now, defense is a little bit different. Defense is more react. So I think the defense will be a step ahead of the offense when they hit the ground running. But that offense has to get that timing down, that continuity down. And Atlanta, while I don't see them as a juggernaut, I, they're not one of my four or five favorite teams to win the NFC uh, in 2021. Atlanta is playing in that place, in that dome. I've been in that dome. It is very loud. It's going to be packed. You don't want that home team to just jump out on you like that, get the momentum, and have you play catch up the entire game. So hopefully, as Lane Johnson alluded to last night, they're keeping things very vanilla, but I just wish they could just get a few more reps. But that's a difficult thing to do because – of the cautious, cautious nature that Nick Sirianni and other coaches are taking because of the constant worry about frontline players getting banged up. And let's face it, from what we've seen right now of this team, once you get from the frontline players to the second-tier players, in a lot of cases with this team, the drop-off is significant in talent. Uh, Degon, I hear what you're saying, and I think Nick Sirianni is wise to be overly cautious with a bunch of players on his team. Yep. Lane Johnson, hurt, don't yep. let fly. Yeah. Uh, Brandon Brooks didn't play almost all last year. Don't play right. fine. Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz both hurt last year. Yep. Didn't play last. All right, fine. Are you telling me that Jalen Hurts is going to start the season having thrown seven passes in the preseason as Ten a reps. second year player who didn't Ten see the field reps. till week uh, 14 last week? He's going to get seven passes in the preseason and go, go beat the Falcons. It's the way it looks right now, although officially Sirianni has not named Jalen yeah. Hurts as the starting quarterback. You know? Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. We saw Flacco and Mullins play last night. You don't have to announce anything. We all know it's going to be Jalen Hurts. We, uh, You know what? I, if I'm a betting man and if I'm playing with Monopoly money, I'm putting all of my Monopoly money on Jalen Hurts as your starting yeah. quarterback. But what we've seen of Flacco, again, is based on Flacco playing with a, a collection of young players still finding their way, second-tier offensive linemen around him. He didn't even get to throw to, to Goddard or Ertz last night, so that the chemistry there is limited as well. You know, um, Sirianni was, and, and the coaching staff was very ecstatic about the work they put in in a controlled environment against the Patriots. I'm sure they'll do some exceptional things next week in a controlled environment against the Jets. But for me, it's always about those game reps. The speed's a little bit different. You know, the quarterback's not getting hit in those controlled reps. You know, uh, there's no unnecessary shots taken in those controlled reps. You know, when it, when it, when it, when you drop the flag for real, you know, that's when everything, you know, expedites a little bit more, becomes a little bit more serious. And, I, just, you know, Flacco's been around the block. He knows this game inside and out. But when you're trying to learn the game in a new system with a collection of new people, there needs to be some type of cohesion. A little bit better cohesion, I think, when you when you hit the ground running when it counts for real. Yeah, that's a that's a good word, D God. I want to talk about reps because 
And I want to talk about the starting quarterback, and I'm going to call him the starting quarterback because right. he's protected more than Tom Brady and Peyton Manning in his prime. So I'm going to say he's the starting quarterback. Um, and I want to compare it to Devontae Smith because we all know Devontae Smith. We saw him at Alabama. This is the Heisman right. Trophy winner. This is a kid with a top tier skill set. I mean, tippy top skill set to play right. the wide receiver position. You saw the ability to get off the line of scrimmage. You saw the route running. And oh, by the way, you saw the hiccups because guess what? Those are his first NFL reps. He made a lot of mistakes. Now we but, have a yeah. second year quarterback right. who's got a little bit more experience. And no disrespect to Jalen Hurts, but he doesn't have right, that right. top tier skill set. And we're going to send him to Atlanta on September 12th with 10 reps under his belt and say, go do it, Jalen Hurts. I, I got a problem with that. And, you know, yeah. as you mentioned, that's the plan. And the Eagles are going to value the joint practices with the Jets more than the preseason game. Boy, if this goes badly, I, I think it's going to be fair to criticize not only Nick Sirianni, but this is an organizational decision. This comes from the top. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, if it goes bad the first game, you know, you still have 16 games to get it right, you know. But when you look at the first four games they have to play coming out of the gate, you start out with Atlanta, then you then you have the 49ers. And when the 49ers are healthy, that is one of the most rugged teams in all of the National Football League on both sides yeah, of the Bose football. Bosa's back, yeah. yeah Bosa's back. All those guys that were hurt last year, I mean, the 49ers were just decimated. We talk about how the Eagles were decimated by injuries last year. That 49ers defense was decimated by injuries last year, which which contributed to heavily to their demise in 2020. Then after that, you have to go down to Dallas on a Monday night and face that offense if Dak Prescott is healthy. And I'm watching CeeDee Lamb on that hard knocks, you know, and, and watching him. And, and this kid is flat out scary with his, with the footballs in his hands. Then you come back home and you got to face Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs. That's a tough murderer's row to start a season with. Um, if they can come out of that at least two to two and two, they're still in a very good position. Um, but man, if they started 0 and 4, and I'm not being negative, people out there, D Gun, don't be negative. I'm not being <laughs> negative. I'm trying to be a realist. I'm being realistic about the possibilities here. Then we're going to look back and say, well, it's because of the lack of reps they got in game situations in preseason. It wasn't a cohesion. You know, if, if the running game doesn't establish itself, if the deep, if the deep go routes are off by a fraction of a second, overthrows, underthrows, we're going to attribute it to, man, they could have used a few more game reps to get this thing right. And now look where they are right now behind the eight ball. Egon, we've heard from the defensive coordinator, Jonathan Gannon, that a uh, big part of what he's going to try and instill is deception. We're going to hit you with stuff that you're not going to see coming. Right. Well, he didn't hit the Patriots with anything. The only thing yeah, we didn't see yeah. coming was effective Eagle defensive play. Right. Are we going to buy into that? Oh, yeah. Deception, deception. And we're keeping our deception deceptive. We're not going to let you see it. We're not going to show you anything. That's easy to say, but it's tough to swallow. You swallow on any of it? You know, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt until I see it for real. And, and I understand you don't want to play the, play your hand yet. And I know they're going to line up in some four threes. They're going to line up in some three fours. They're going to, they're going to give you a, a quarterback uh, defensive looks. And then all of a sudden back out of those looks and, and bring something else when you, and bring blitzes from places you're not expecting. Uh, all we can go by is what he tells us right now. You know, um, and, you, and you look at teams, a lot of teams don't show you a whole lot. They play basics. I mean, look at the Patriots. They ran the ball 44 times last night. Okay. Um, and what, what was alarming to me was even though it was second tier linemen in the trenches, they ran the ball so effectively in the middle of that Eagles defense and the Eagles just couldn't stop it. I don't care who was running the ball for them, whether it was Sony Michelle, whether it was this kid Stevenson, um, you know, Harris, Damian Harris, they were just running up and down the field on this Eagles defense. And I thought the two young guys, Milton Williams and T Y McGill, who played a good game last week would at least step up and would give them better stout, stouter support in the run game. And it just didn't happen for the most part. So there's still a whole lot of work to be done. And let's face it, Sirianni has to play all these young guys as much as possible because there's some significantly tough decisions to make in terms of who's going to make this final roster when they break camp. And based on what we saw last night, 
those decisions are still very tough to make because, again, outside of Singleton, T.J. Edwards, not many, you know, uh, on either side of the ball, Devontae Smith, not many on either side of the ball really jumped out and established themselves. You know, Matt Pryor had a rough night in the trenches. Um, you know, Nate Herbick had enough enough night in the trenches as well. Um, so there's still some work to be done. And, you know, I'm just glad I'm not in that decision-making process for, for this team. Yeah. Last one from me, D-Gun. A live yep. post-game show, Jacob Media. I know you got to run, but uh, Derek Gunn, Mark Farzetta, Devin Caney, I'm a part of it. Bigger, Lane Johnson's a part of it. That's bigger than me. Uh, but D-Gun, you mentioned, we've been talking about the players. I want to talk about Nick Sirianni from this perspective. I mentioned that okay. that that 52 to nothing number over the past six quarters. Um, right. You mentioned the running game. Pittsburgh did the same thing in the second right. half. It was just running the football, no time of possession for the offense. I mentioned the third downs. They they went nearly six quarters without converting a third down in the preseason. At one point, do we have to give the, the head coach who's the play caller some confidence to say, okay, I don't care who's out there, first team, second team, third team. Right. Let's right. have some success on the offensive side of the football to give the play caller some confidence. Yeah, I agree with that. You you have to mix it up a little bit, you know. When 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 nothing's working for you, I don't care if it is a preseason game, just flip the script a little bit just to get some kind of adrenaline going on your sideline, some cohesiveness, something to get excited about, even if you don't score any points. But we didn't see any of that. You know, we, we still saw missed throws, missed assignments, uh, things of that nature. And I really, you know, we really don't know a whole lot about what Nick Sirianni is or is not as a play caller based on what we saw. And I'm not going to put a whole lot of emphasis on it because it's the preseason. You know, it was a little bit disappointing. But, you know, I'm sure he's learning along the way. It's one thing to be a coordinator or an assistant in this game. It's another thing when the onus falls on your shoulders solely and you've got a play clock to worry about, getting the information in from your offensive coordinator to you, to your quarterback. So, you know, that's a little bit different situation. So I I'm still trying to give Sirianni the benefit of the doubt. And, and again, I can't emphasize enough. I'm not going to come down on this team uh, individually, collectively, for what we have not seen over the first couple of games. It's a little bit concerning at this point, but, you know, who knows? Nick Sirianni may come out of a bag of tricks with something we are not even thinking about and not even seeing, and that's all we have to rest on now because I expect to see much of the same thing next week against the Jets. Very vanilla, very bland. Let's get out of here unscathed with uh, minimal in injuries, you know, they lost a the young man. I didn't think he was going to make the roster anyway, but they lost a the young man, Jason Kroom, last night, yeah. you know, with a severe knee injury. If I'm a head coach, I'm holding my breath because that could have been Zach Ertz. That could have been Dallas Goddard. It could have been Richard Rodgers. So let's get out of there. Let's regroup. Let's look over the three games of what we need to do. We have 16 days after that last game to get this right, and hopefully we can make enough corrections to go down there and shock the world in Atlanta. He did a great job for years for NBC Sports Philly slash Comcast Sportsnet. I still call it Comcast Sportsnet. Yeah, Sorry yeah. about that. Um, That's all right. And now he's going to do a great job for us all year long on the post game show live right here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. D Gun, uh, we'll be watching you after the game every single week. And we're going to ask you to go get up every once in a while and up on Birds 365 for us. Hey, man, you know, I don't usually get up this early unless I'm catching a flight or going fishing. So, you know, you guys are special for me to get up this early. I need my beauty rest, as you can tell. When next we get D-Gun on, you'll see the uh, fly fishing uh, over his right <laughs> shoulder because he'll be, he'll be running out to the uh, lake shortly thereafter. <laughs> D-Gun, great stuff. Thanks, buddy. All right, man. You guys have a great day. Thanks for having me on. That Thanks, is Derek Gunn, uh, host of the live post-game show here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel all year long. Uh, Mark Poizetta. I didn't get a chance to watch last night, Johnny, so I apologize for missing you, uh, Devin Caney. And uh, Johnny Mack and Lane Johnson will be a big part of it as well. Uh, let me follow up on something you kind of touched on. You asked D. Gunn, I want to ask it of you. Um, you threw out all the very ugly numbers about the Eagles offense over the last six quarters. That'd be zero points. Uh, it, well into game number two before they ever got a third down conversion, and not good. Um, yeah, the offense has been non-existent would be one way I would think to describe it. Oh, by the way, 52 to nothing. There's a 52 on the other side. 
The other team in a six-quarter period put up 52 points. That's not good either. I watched the Patriots just shred. And I know it was their second and some third, and in some cases even fourth team guys in the second half. And Pittsburgh last week in the second half doing it against the Eagles. Backup defensive guys. Well, their backup defensive guys might need to play. They yeah. better not because they look god awful. Which has been worse, the Eagles offense or the Eagle defense? Yeah, it's a, it's a chicken and egg causality argument. I mean, it really is. They haven't been able to stop the run game, as Derek Gunn mentioned. So that's been that's been the big big issue. And you look at Sean Bradley. It's mainly been Sean Bradley and. Uh, Rashad Smith in there at linebacker, and uh, look, I, that's a big concern. But I go to the to the first team, and I say, well, Alex Singleton is a is a really good run defender, but Eric Wilson, you know, the knock on him coming from Minnesota, great pass coverage linebacker, couldn't stop anybody in the run. So I think the hope is that Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave, when they play. Can, can do enough things up front to keep blockers off Eric Wilson. That won't be uh, as big a deficiency as it looks right now. But you're right. I mean, T.J. Edwards can stop the run, Alex Singleton. Other than that, I look at these linebackers and say, Oof. It, you know, people talk about modern football. They want speed on the field defensively, just like they do offensively. They're more worried about pass coverage. Right up until you got a Bill Belichick of the world, or or Tennessee comes in with a Derrick Henry or New England, yeah, you know, uh, people who know people that zag when everybody else is zigging, so to speak. And Bill Belichick, I talked about it on the show. He's always been that guy. And if you can't stop the run, guess what? Everybody thinks you got to pass the football. Jeffrey Lurie wants to pass the football. He's right. Everybody wants to pass the football. Right up until you can run the football, and then you say, yeah, why bother? I'm going to run it right down your throat. And right now, that's what people are doing to the Eagles in the preseason. Now, Sean Bradley's not going to be out there. Rashad Smith's not going to be out there. But we don't exactly have Dick Buckus either. So yeah, it's a little bit of a concern that that they're having such an issue. Right. And, oh, by the way, uh, let's go to the Sam linebacker. Did Avery do anything to impress you the first couple weeks of preseason? Well, the only thing I noticed about Jannard Avery is we finally we saw the vanilla. We talked about it with Derek Gunn. We talked about offense, defense. Eagles aren't showing anything. They did show some of the Mike Zimmer uh, uh, a gap sh- uh, looks where they sugar the a gaps and put the linebacker right over the center. Uh, usually, Zimmer puts two. In that case, it would be Eric Kendricks and Anthony Barr. Who, oh by the way are really good players. They did it with Jannard Avery. They only did it with one. So it was a little, you saw a little bit of a tweak. Yeah, it, there was some disruption. Uh, so I did like that. That's one positive that they actually unveiled that. And I think it's going to be part of the Eagles game plan defensively. Problem is they don't have Eric Kendricks and Anthony Barr. Right. So I, you know, I don't. Can Jannard Avery be Anthony Barr? Good luck with that. Or Joe Osman. Man. I know that Kerrigan is probably going to get a lot of time there, and he has. I don't know yet. if he is. I thought that originally, but it looks like it looks like it's going to be Avery and maybe Patrick Johnson as a rookie. Pat, uh, Patrick, jo- Patrick Johnson do anything to impress you last night? He played a lot on special teams, so that that shows me that they're. He's going to make the roster, right? Because they're 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 using him on special teams and saying, "Okay, we got to, this kid's going to be here. We got to get him up to speed." But no, I I told you the only people I could come up with were T.J. Edwards, and I also had Jack Stoll on the list until he dropped the ball that turned into an interception. So it's really hard to find any positive. I was down to talking about traits like Devontae Smith's route running, really good. I was talking about traits. He dropped three passes. And I know only one's official, but he dropped three passes. And look, I give the kid credit because that back shoulder throw was a perfect throw from Joe Flacco. And I saw a lot of people defending Devontae Smith because they want to defend the first round pick. And I get it. And they don't care about Joe Flacco, the 14 year. He shouldn't be here. He gets paid too much. 
That was a perfect throw. And I think Devontae Smith, I give him a lot of credit. He said, I got to get my head around. I did a bad job. I, I give him all the credit in the world for admitting I got to catch that football. And he called it a perfect throw. And Nick Sirianni, to his credit, said the same thing. Look, this we got the Heisman. I, at some point, you start thinking, what is Is it the water in Philadelphia? We got the Heisman Trophy winner. All we've been talking about is how dominant this kid was at the college level. And we're not wrong. One of the historic seasons, and he shows up in Philadelphia the first time, and he drops three passes right away. It's unbelievable. And you talked uh, before we punched the gun up about trying to put a positive spin on it. I give two guys credit. Uh, our buddy uh, Johnny Sunshine, who was on in the <laughs> post game show, he talked about the phenomenal separation that Devontae Smith. It was. Does. It was. That, but was, that's what we're talking about traits. We're but talking I, about traits. I, I looked at it the same way you did. If I had to give Devontae Smith a grade, for his first game in an Eagle uniform, that's all plays that he was involved with. He's a C plus, a B minus. Uh, I, mean, I, I think he might be kind. I give little, him a C little, minus. Little generous there. I, um, I give him a C minus. You got to catch the football. Uh, well, the first one was a bad drop. The second one, here's where I'm going to cut him slack about the back shoulder throw. What is the back shoulder throw? It's all about timing. It is about chemistry and time. And he's yeah. playing with Joe Flacco, which he has had X amount of snaps with through the entire preseason because he got hurt. He wasn't out there. That is a purely timing play. That's not his ability, his uh, his physical traits, what he did at Alabama. No, that's all about timing and practice and what you've been able to work on with that particular quarterback wide receiver play. And they haven't had any. So the yeah, timing was a little bit fair. off. Flacco either threw a little early or Devontae turned a little bit late. Neither one of us know for sure. I'm going to no, put that one aside. For sure. We know for sure because the head coach admitted it. The wide receiver himself admitted it. He didn't get his head around. I said it immediately when I saw it on the field. He's got to get his head around quicker. And he knows it. And I give him credit for that. Joe Flacco protected him because Joe Flacco is a, a veteran guy. He understands. That was a big time throw. And, you know, I, I always talk about the best in the business at that are Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams. You're right. It's a chemistry thing. Yeah. Uh, but when you do that right, it is indefensible. It There's nothing stop. you can do. You cannot yeah, stop you it. You cannot stop it. It was it was perfect. And, yeah, you're right. The chemistry, the timing is not there with Devontae Smith. And that takes me back to what we were talking with D. Gunn and what we were talking in the first segment as well. Reps. This guy is super talented. That's why I'm using Devontae Smith when I talk about J Jalen Hurts. Nothing against Jalen Hurts, but Jalen Hurts doesn't have the talent at the quarterback position that Devontae Smith has at the wide receiver position. That's what I'm comparing. And even Devontae Smith needs reps. He needs reps as a young player. He needs to get it down. Jalen Hurts is going into week one, and, and, and I believe Derek Gunn is right. The plan right now, and it could change because he got sick and he didn't even get his two series he was supposed to get. The plan from the Eagles is that he's not playing against the Jets. So that means Jalen Hurts is going to Atlanta with 10 preseason reps, and you see a top-tier talent struggle because he hasn't gotten reps I I I don't like it. I don't like it. Here's here's why I'm okay with it when it comes to the quarterback position. And I question the decision of the organization, coach included, but don't kid yourself, not by himself. This was made across the board on the Eagle organization as to who was going to play, who wasn't going to play last night, save Jalen Hurts, who got sick. Uh, here's why I'm okay with Jalen not playing next week. Do you really want to see Joe Flacco in a regular season game? Do you really yeah. want to see Nick Mullins in a game that actually Look, I get I, I get the injury part of it, but this is my this has been my argument since day one, since the NFL. <clears throat> they haven't gone to you know load management like like the NBA or Major League Baseball, whatever. But no matter what these guys say, the sports science guys, you can't legislate injuries. Nobody knows. 
Brandon Brooks is going to show up June and he's working out like a madman and he looks like a bodybuilder and he looks like he should be at SummerSlam with John Cena and Roman Reigns. And that's for you, Jody, at SummerSlam week. Uh, and, he, and he pulls up and he tears his Achilles and working out in June with nobody else on the field. You can't legislate injuries. You know, Carl Lawson with your team and, and D Gunn is talking, you know, those things, you know, Jason Croom, uh, who's not a big name player, obviously, but we feel bad for the kid, significant knee injury, non-contact, non-contact. You can't legislate injuries. And when you have young players who need reps to get better, it's football. You got to give them the reps. Here's where's where I agree with you and disagree with you. Disagree. Oh, you can legislate injury. If you don't go on the field, I'm going to bet Jalen Hurts doesn't get hurt standing on the sideline next week. That he will start the game and finish the game on the sideline in one piece and he will do the same next week. Or as soon as it's done. Game's over. He goes back to the locker room. They check him. He's good to go for the opener. You can legislate injury. Now, at what cost? Yes, the lack of reps. And if he goes down and he looks like he's not on the same page with Devontae Smith and Rager and Goddard and everybody else in game number one against the Falcons, you can look back and go, ooh, maybe we should have played. Maybe we should have taken a risk. Yes, it's a risk to go out there. Every single time you take a snap in a National Football League game, it's a risk. You have to weigh that. You have to measure it. You have to put it on the scales and see if it's worth it or not. We can sit here and second guess afterwards whether they were too cautious or not cautious enough. So I think yeah, you can well, like you're it. right. I mean, when he's standing there, yeah, he's not going to get hurt. You're right. Uh, but pregame, uh, when he's working out, he might strain a calf. He might. We've seen that. We've seen that happen all over the NFL. Uh, he might uh, tweak his hamstring. He might hurt his groin. I, it, especially with younger players. I'm. I mean, that's the mentality of this league. For the look, I always bring up Zach Ertz because he's the one who told me. Uh, injury rate in this league is 100%. If you play long enough, you're going to get hurt. Um, I don't know. You can put people under glass um, with young players who need reps. Look, I agree. I said I agree with the Lane Johnsons of the world, the Brandon Brooks of the world, the Fletcher Coxes, the proven players, the Brandon Grahams. When you need young players who, who are developing, when you have young players that are developing, like Jalen Hurts, Devontae Smith, Jalen Rager, um, um, Quez Watkins, you got to play them. You got to play them so they can get better. And, oh, by the way, they're playing uh, the receivers. They let them play a half because they needed it. And you saw they still need it. They need more, all of them. So that was part of the problem. And then secondary is the fact that, look, it's not their fault that Jalen Hurts couldn't play last night. He was scheduled to play, very limited, but now he didn't play. So now you got to adjust. We got to get this kid some reps, and it doesn't look like he's getting any reps. We will adjust here on Birds 365 after an Eagles 35 to nothing butt kicking at the hands of the Patriots. Yeah, I know it's a preseason game. I know it doesn't matter. If you invested close to three hours last night and you were rooting for the hometown green team, I'm sorry. That's just not a good look. Uh, we'll continue to break it down. John McMullen, Jody McDonald. Oh, we got our guy Chris Franklin is ready to go early. We'll come back and punch him up next from NJ.com. Here with us on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say... But as I always say... It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest... Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. 
Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Hour number two here on Birds 365. Gets number two here on Birds 365. And we'll put, put pressure on him because, let's be honest, Jordy Mack, not overly optimistic about the birds last night. Uh, John McMullen, he didn't love what he saw. Uh, Derek Gunn came on and he tried to give us a good spin, but he said, I can't really do it. So, Chris <laughs> Franklin, how are you going to come up with the positives from last night's Eagles 35 to nothing butt kicking at the hands of the Patriots? I mean, I could lie to you guys. I mean, come up with something saying, hey, there's marshmallows falling from the sky and stuff. But uh, it, it was rough to watch. It was a rough to watch at times. Really well, I, I, I still want to take you down to the gumdrop river, Chris. I want something <laughs> positive. I want something. Give me something positive you took out of this game. I got Devontae Smith's traits, you know, his route running. Maybe a little TJ Edwards and pass coverage. I thought he had a, a pretty nice uh, game. But it is really tough. You got to dig deep. In Aaron Sippos, maybe? That's there you I go. Mean. He was good. Hunting <laughs> yeah. was good, and he got a good kickoff. Yeah, off good too. kickoff. Yeah. Yeah. You, you learned who the backup holder was? Yeah, you learned that Zach Ertz can hold is the backup holder. I mean, that's it, 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 especially after a performance yeah. like that, when you're looking at stuff like that, you, you don't have – I thought Patrick Johnson a little bit, he, he showed some stuff at times, you know, when it came to setting the edge, but it, it was really, really tough finding things, and you thought – especially coming in the second preseason game, even if it's for the young guys, they're getting used to the system. They didn't show a lot defensively, especially, but you thought they would play a lot better, you know, getting more experience and we just didn't get that. And by the way, Chris, you made me think you could say Aaron Seapost was actually better than the Patriots kicker. So oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> zero for zero. Definitely. He's a hundred percent. You know, he didn't miss anything. It was perfect. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's where I want to go, Chris. And again, if uh, you want to be, uh, if you want to beg off because you don't know, because John does know, I don't know. I'm asking you to speculate her here. Both and I won- wondered about the entire plan who to play, who not to play, who was hurt, who wasn't hurt, who's a veteran, who's a youngster who didn't play. It's just trying to find the thought process of Nick Sirianni if we believe he's making all these calls because. He's the head coach. You think he's supposed to make those calls? What his line of logic was across the board with all the roster? We're having trouble adding it up and coming out with an answer. So John and I are both speculating that this is a multi-layer and level decision. 
It's not just Nick Sirianni. It's Nick Sirianni. It's the veteran players. It's the medical staff. It's Howie Roseman. Shoot, maybe Jeff Lurie submitted a roster as to who we wanted to see and not see last night. Who's deciding what Eagles are and aren't on the field in these preseason games? If I had to speculate, I would say it would be the I would say Howie Roseman had some say in it because I remember during the introductory press conference when they were asking Nick Sirianni who was going to have control of the roster, Howie said he'd have control over 53 and Nick would have control over game day. So if there's a lot of questions that you have, you want to see more, you see these younger guys or guys in a bubble play more, you'd be more apt to try to see that. I'm on this side, uh, for, for me personally, I think I'm on the side of Jalen Hurts really wasn't feeling good towards towards then. And if that, and especially if he wasn't feeling good, you don't want to expose him, put him behind that second tier, that second team line, offensive line, because we saw what happens when they were in there going against the Patriots' first team. You don't want to expose him to that to that uh, pressure that they were throwing. So I think that was the case there. When it comes to some of the older veterans, I think they were just like, hey, you know what? We don't want to risk these because. We've seen this team's history when it comes to injuries last season, and you don't want to put those guys in the situations too. So I really think it's, I think it goes as high as Howie Roseman. Maybe Laurie has some input, but I probably think it's more Roseman to see some of those other guys to see who he should be able to cut, who's to keep around, practice squad, et cetera. Yeah, Chris, more than Jalen Hurts because, yeah, he got sick. I think that was just a bad break, and there's nothing Nick Sirianni can do about it. So, I want to take you down this route because from my perspective, it's it's the the what I've called the herky jerky nature of the process. In other words, you know, the left side of the offensive line's got to play, but the right side doesn't. The 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 young receivers are out there for a half, but Miles Sanders is out there for four plays. Miles Sanders doesn't play at all in week one, he plays in week two. Defense back seven's out there, uh, other than Darius Slay. Front four is not out there. Now, I'm not talking about the injured guys, but the, the Fletcher Coxes, the Brandon Grahams, the Josh Sweats who could have played. How does that help the back seven who's got to play with those guys that they can't get reps? And how does that help Jordan Mailata who's got to develop a chemistry with the offensive line? And it, it, it's all fragmented to me. It doesn't – that part of it doesn't make sense to me. If you're going to sit, guys, sit everybody. That that would make sense to me. <laughs> it really is weird in that aspect, and and I'm even trying to like think like trying to look from their angle. Like, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to see how this one subsection does when it faces adversity? But then, then you're like, why just I, that, the whole Miles Miles Sanders thing? I thought he should have gotten reps in the first game, and second, and then build him up a little bit, and then pull pull him out, give him one series. So I still don't understand a lot of it when it comes to this playing time rotation when it comes to a lot of stuff. I mean, if you want to get my, my, a lot of my opinion shouldn't be playing either because Dillard, you want to risk yeah. him to injury. If you're going to yeah. pull Kelsey, anybody you want to have Dillard in there, you don't have Dillard. So you have Tolf and, and pull Driscoll. It's just a mess over there. So I don't know a lot of those decisions. It's just flabbergasting to me. I, I, I wish I could be like, Hey, you know what? This is the person here. This is the here. It's, Herky jerky, yeah, she is a pretty good adjective, but it was it's it it's tongue tying. It's, it's yeah, I can't even put it because something right for it, but <laughs> I don't know. I the only thing I can think of is that they're trying to look at each individual subsection, but that still to me is just asinine. It doesn't make any sense. So it's I don't know who these guys are. And I like asinine. That's how I would describe <laughs> it. I like I like asinine because I I agree. I don't it. it it's tough to make sense out of it. And I think that's why you look at 62, uh, six quarters and it's 52 nothing. Right? Mm-hmm. It's preseason, but 52 nothing is 52 nothing. You figure you throw out there and try, it might be, I don't know, 52 14, 52 20, 52 nothing is tough. Understood. All right, Chris, uh, since we're pointing the accusatory finger of guilt, let me point it in one direction. Me. Because Uh-oh. I started to buy in last week. Quez Watkins had the two big plays. Uh, Jalen Rager made this unbelievable OBJ-type catch. 
My partner, John McMullen, told me the best wide receiver in camp last week was Jay Jaw, uh, making catches <laughs> everywhere. Oh, Mr. Boy. August again. Oh. So, I, I take <laughs> Did the you see that of, drop, by the way? Oh. I, I take the stance of, what do you mean we need a veteran wide receiver? We got all these young guys. Look at Jalen Rager. Look at Quez Watkins. Look at Jay, Jay Jaw. Well, a wide receiver. Why do we need a veteran wide receiver? Well, between those three last night, they had one catch for five yards for Rager. And, oh, by the way, that's it. Quez Watkins, zero. Jay George, zero. Hightower, zero. And I bought into the hype of practice. And, oh, they got the better of the Patriots in practice. But then they actually play a game, a preseason game, a game that doesn't count in the standing, but a game just the same. And they do not uh, – does this team desperately need a veteran wide receiver in that room to help out? First off, if it is your fault, uh, the punishment Philadelphia court says no rose porks for you. If you got, if you cause all this, so there goes that, but I'm still, I take, I take my punishment. I'll take my medicine. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the, Veteran wide receiver, I'm in the camp of you don't need one because I think it's very important that you let these receivers grow with Hurts, especially if he's going to be, if you're hoping that he's a long term solution there. Uh, they did not, there's no sugar coat or anything. They had a bad game. It, it was really, it, it was bad. Some of the throws, so, some of the things you saw, like Smith and you small, saw Rager at times. I mean, Rager had, I didn't like the hustle after one play on that interception. It was like he just gave up on the route at the end. Mm. But some of the times, I, I put some of the fault on Flacco and Mullins because they were some of these guys were breaking open and they just like hesitated, pulled down. I mean, Flacco had Smith starting to break open and he had him earlier in the route and he just looked pulled just like, no. And then look back a split second goes, yeah, no, maybe I should go to him. It, it was just a thick, I look at it as a failure from all three positions for all three levels of the offense last night. And even if you had a veteran wide receiver, a, I don't see one who can make an impact enough that, is it really going to gain you two or three wins? And do you think two or three wins are actually going to get you to win the NFC East? It's definitely not going to get a wild card because I don't think this team is good enough. It's going to get enough wins to get a wild card. So I don't think they're in a position. They don't. It's, it's now is not the right time. I think to get a veteran wide receiver, let give these guys a year, let them develop. Jay Jaw, I think he had a good week of camp, but I think that experiment's done. I'd still let High Towers come in and see that. But yeah, that this role a, that they have that was an egregious drop from JJ. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I look at practice and you know, forget about JJ. Let's talk about Jalen, Jalen Rager. And we've seen it, Chris, we've seen it up close. We see him in one-on-ones. He, at times he runs tremendous routes and he's able to shake uh, defensive backs. And then the lights go on. I thought he was playing defensive back. I, I thought he was trying to stick to the cornerback. <laughs> that, I, I mean, he, he looked like Travis Fulgham against uh, who, who's that big corner on the Patriots that completely shut him down. Uh, I Nick forget Jackson, his name. Or, but anyway, uh, J, J, J. Wan, J. Johns, J. Wan, is it? Jason Either Jackson, way. Royals, yeah. Either yeah. way. I, he looked like he was playing cornerback. I mean, he looked like he was trying to stick to the guy. Where is the route running when the light comes on for Jalen Rager? I've seen him do it in practice. Why doesn't it translate? I don't know if it's a confidence thing. I don't know if it's one of those things where he starts to look at everything and he's you get into the stadium field, you hear the music player, you got the fans yelling, and then it's like, uh-oh, it's time to get ready. I don't know. It's hard to tell because, like you said, you see him – you see him make the route running. He's gotten better. I'll put it this way. He's gotten better as tra- train camp has progressed. Cause remember Nick Sirianni was on him, and then yeah. it's yeah. like, he it's like everything finally clicked, but I, I think it's more, maybe it's just a situation where he just realizes a game and he starts getting in his head a little bit more. And then that's when all the stuff that he learned, it doesn't really translate to the field because his routes looked a lot sloppier than we've seen in the past. I mean, we've seen him. He's fluid. He's, he's fluid when he gets out of his breaks, he's makes, these catches, these catches. I mean, anybody's seen that one-handed catch, and now it's like I think it's when the spotlight comes on and the cameras come on. It's one of the things he tenses up a little bit, and that's he's not the only one. I think. I think when you look at him, I think you look at Travis Fulgham. I think it's. I think a lot when you look at these guys, it's, it's, you wonder what the, what's going on with it. You really do, Monster. Chris. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you to evaluate the running back position. Did we learn anything last night? We've got uh, more practices against the Jets. <laughs> controlled uh, practices and then a final preseason game against the Jets next Friday. So they have one more week 
to sort it out with performance. What we had last night's performance, uh, certainly Miles Sanders is going to be the number one, and he actually had a nice 10-yard run last night to get everything going, and then thereafter he was pretty much out, and all the other guys got a chance to play. Um, did your thought process on how they're going to use and who's going to be here in the running back room change at all last night? I don't think it has for me because the one person I really wanted to see, but he was out because of a rib injury, was Jason Huntley. I had originally had the team possibly keep him five only if Huntley was going to be returning kicks. But I think right now when you look at just the way the room is, I, Elijah Holyfield ran well, but I just don't see him unseating either Kenny Gainwell. He get rid of Kenny Gainwell, Jordan Howard, I mean Scott or Sanders. He, I don't see him being better than that. So it looks like he's going to be back on the practice squad again. I mean, if it's, you're in a pinch and Jordan Howard goes down, he's a nice short, short yardage option. But you really didn't learn anything in, in – in, I'm just more – I'm looking to see – and they're probably hiding it because it's the preseason. They don't want to give away the thing. I just want to see when they have those two backs, such as Sanders and Gainwell on the field or Sanders and Scott, what they do with it because I think that can be an explosive one-two combo with just what you can do formational-wise and singling up against linebackers and corner, linebackers especially and sometimes safety. So I don't think there's anything that came of it. I, just, I wish we saw Jason Huntley a little bit more. Yeah, you bring something up there with the 21 personnel. The one thing Nick Sirianni has been consistent about is that he's not going to show anything in the preseason. <laughs> he thinks he has an advantage. But I asked Dee Dunn about this, so I'm going to ask you about it. At what point do you look at this, some of these numbers? And as I said, 52 to nothing. They didn't, it took them till a minute and 51 left in the second quarter to convert a third down. They didn't convert a third down against Pittsburgh. So almost six quarters of football. At what point does that affect the confidence of the play caller? Uh, or does it affect the confidence of the play caller? Because you look at that's a big, as Jerry Seinfeld might say, that's a big matzo ball, 52 to nothing. <laughs> I mean, I what? I, I, I mean, that's, that's bad. How, can that affect his confidence? I don't think it was because I think he's really holding on to that. But there's another number, number uh, stat looking at time of possession. I mean, they've been getting killed in that yeah. aspect too, which is going to be a domino effect and affect that defense, the depth of that defense, because they're going to be on the field so long. It, you start to wear those guys down. You see early in the season. So if you need them later on, you got an extra mileage. But I don't think – I think he's banking on the fact that he – nobody's truly seen the other stuff that that offense can do or some of those other unique formation or personnel packages they want to use. So I think he can rely on that aspect. Now, two games in, if they're still really sluggish, which is a definite possibility because this offense hasn't had extended time in game situations to get to play together after two, I'd probably say after two or three games, then you start to worry a little bit seeing if they can get anything going when it comes to play calling. Do you have to scale back some things? But I think for right now, I wouldn't be too concerned, but, Absolutely, ask me about two or three weeks into the season, and that answer might change, though. All right, Chris, I'm going to give you a spin job here, tell you ahead of time that it's nothing but spin, but I'm going to get you the answer just the same. Uh, it's good news. Hmm. When the Eagles go to their backup defensive linemen, there's a big drop off. When they go to their backup linebackers, there's a big drop off. When they go to their backup secondary, there's a big drop off. They're all pretty bad dropping off. Which one scares you the least? Mm -hmm. If they do oh, have wow. injuries, if there are oh. guys out, if the season gets underway and a couple of guys are on IR, is there any, if you're talking about the, the secondary, the linebackers, or the D-line where you go, uh, okay, that's the one place we could afford to lose somebody because the drop-off is there, but it's not as bad as it would be in the other two. Well, that's a good one. Whew. I'm going to go defensive line. And I'm going to say, I thought T.Y. McGill, especially the defensive tackle, I thought T.Y. McGill and Raekwon Williams, I think they're all right. Marlon Tulipolotu, I just don't see it. Uh, he got, oh, there, there was a, I think it was, like a, it was a wham block or trap that he went too far out and he took the bait and he got smashed. I just don't see it. But also you look at some of these other guys, I think uh, Teron Jackson, he played better. Uh, you look at Milton Williams, I think he's got a real good future ahead of him just for his versatility, and especially if they start playing some odd man fronts, I think he could be very valuable there. I think that's where you see it. The secondary, it it, it's, it, it could need some help. I mean, Michael Jaquette had another bad uh, 
bad outing. I mean, everybody's, I know everybody's which, looking at which that. Which Patriot wide receiver was it who put the move on him? That oh, basically I forget. Broke I his ankle. Yeah. Looked like an Allen Iverson crossover. <laughs> <laughs> he's still in the spin cycle right now. I mean, that's, it's just, that he's just had a bad camp. I mean, and you see, and you see the guys on the sideline, they're trying to cheer him up. I mean, when they were doing the red zone series, you saw Slay and Nelson try to cheer him up. They were like, hyping him up, going, hey, you did a good job sticking him close to that. But just like we were talking about with just previously, is something when it comes to those games. And and I thought I had high hopes for him. I thought he was a bigger corner compared to what they used to have. He could physical, he'll be all right. But it just seems like if he can't get his hands on somebody, he's to- he's toast. And it's rough to see that. But the defensive line, I think, is the has the most depth out of everybody when it comes to that one. But the lineback- linebackers, I think, surprisingly, aren't too far off when it comes there. All right. I, I want to talk about, since we only have you for a few more minutes, Chris, I want to talk about the quarterback. And obviously, Jalen Hurts, we didn't get to see him. But if he didn't get sick, he would have only been out there for two series or, or something of that nature. Would have been a quick cameo again. So I want to know, when did Jalen Hurts become Tom Brady? He won't <laughs> name him the starter, but he played 10 reps in the first preseason game. He was supposed to play two series in the second preseason game. And then from what D. Gunn is hearing, from what I'm hearing, the original schedule, maybe it changes because he wasn't able to play. He's not going to play against the Jets at all. Unless they change their thinking. What the heck is going on? This is a second year quarterback with four starts. Doesn't he need reps? He needs reps, but we saw what happens if you have Flacco or Mullins inside that right running in well, there. That's too. a good point. <laughs> but he, he really does truly needs reps. I think you need to get used to the game speed because practice speed goes you can try as much as you can in a practice, but it's still control. When you get to the game speed, that really messes with you. And I think he needs to get the feel of moving in and out, trying to find those windows, being able to elude and escape and getting time to, and, and experiencing more decisions coming out of when to throw the ball and, that, and to see some defenses he hasn't seen. Cause you know, Belichick was going to throw some defenses. He didn't throw in practice just to try to confuse him because he didn't want to show him basically the same look. So I think that was, a it really truly was a missed opportunity. And I was really looking forward to seeing him overall. It, he and I think he needs time to develop that accuracy still in a game, at a game speed. He's gotten better as camp's going along, and his and the one noticeable thing I really noticed is the hard on footwork, and it truly has gotten better because you see him settling his feet. He's getting set and he's going on top of the ball because a lot of times when he was sailing that ball, his release point he wasn't getting his feet set. His release point was high and it was just going way out towards sideline. He still settles into that at times, but it's getting it's getting better. So. He just needs he just needs snaps. He needs reps, and that the fact that he wasn't able to do it out there because of that stomach bug, stomach bug, it's it, it, I think it kind of hurts him in the, in the long run for his development. All right, Chris, I'm going to ask you to speculate behind closed doors with the Eagles on Friday afternoon with the coach addressing the players. I think he's a pretty good motivator. I think the, a lot of the guys on the team. Are like him and are behind him and uh, have enjoyed this camp and kind of believe that Nick Sirianni is one of those coaches who will give them a chance to be better and uh, show their wares and be able to become National Football League players and or make more money because everybody likes that. But the season is about to start and we want to see an improved Eagle team from last year. They're 0 2. I know the scores don't count, I know the standings are irrelevant. But sometimes winning is a mindset. Sometimes you get used to winning. Sometimes it's an inner belief that you can go out there and you can win. They're not only 0-2. Their last game was last night, 35 to nothing. Does Sirianni emphasize winning, at least in his conversation with his players when they take on the Jets next week? Because 0-3 is going to be 0-3, and and you add that on top of 4-11-1, and and all of a sudden you're starting the season going, "Uh uh-oh. How many, how, how how long till Chris? How many shopping days till Christmas? <laughs> I I don't I don't think it'll be so much winning. I think he's going to, uh, and I can just hear it in the Nick Sirianni voice. We're facing adversity right now. I can see him trying to do a rally of the troops. We're facing yeah. adversity right now. 
the fans don't like where we are. The media doesn't like where we are. I don't, and just try to harp on the fact saying, I don't care what everybody else is saying on the outside. I only care what we do on the field. I can, I can just imagine him saying that in his Nick Sirianni voice, like pounding the table. This is how we do it. And, PowerPoints and everything else. We're doubling down, do. Chris. We're doubling <laughs> down. I'm going to smack the table. We're, we're doubling gonna down. We're, we're not going to let these down. guys get this. We're going to yeah. come in there. We're going to get some good practices. And make sure everybody <laughs> read Chris at NJ.com. Does a great job there with his uh, buddy, Mike K, who's also a friend of this show. Um, so check out. And he's been, you know, Chris has been charting Jalen Hurts' progression throughout training camp. But I do want to, you know, getting back to Nick Sirianni, what Jody said. Oh, look, I've always joked. Nick talks about competition. He never wins anything. He doesn't win rock, <laughs> paper, scissors. He always talks about losing. He always he lost the three-point shooting contest to Jake Elliott. He loses. Everybody loses everything to Jake Elliott, except 33-yard <laughs> field goal competition. Right? That's my only shot. However, now we're 0-2 in the preseason. What's Nick Sirianni going to win something? I think there's a, maybe there's a tournament they're having inside where he has a chance. I don't know. Tetherball? I, I, maybe. I don't know. And I thought it was interesting when I was watching that the video that the Eagles released about how he had, it mentioned that he had a hamstring pull sometimes. So you may say, like, hey, you know what, that out, stopped yeah. me back. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe it's it's only so that going that mantra can only go so far until you're like 0 3, 0 4, because then I think that's when the veterans are going to start questioning. And I think he's going to focus. I think I think he's going to focus on series by series case basis. But I mean, they'll say they'll do fish by series, but you know, it's in the back of the coaching staff's mind. Like, hey, we got to string some stuff together or make got to make some changes. So this year is not about. I mean, I suppose with Steve Mariucci about this too, and I actually kind of agree with him too. This year, this team is just to me. This team's not winning division. I thought they were going to win seven games heading in. This is more about player development and seeing if there's any improvement with these young guys who are supposed to be cornerstones of your team, like Devonta Smith, like Jalen Hurts, potentially, and guys like Zach McPherson, Mill Williams, what have you. So if you see them over time, if you can look at game 10, game 11, go, hey, you know what? Remember this preseason, these guys, these young guys didn't look bad. Now they're like, you have some pieces here. You move forward from there. I think they'll take that as a success. If they're 0 2 and they like the players like they've regressed, or not 0 2, 0 10 or 1 in 9 and players like they regressed, then that's how I think you see a lot of red flags coming up. If it were me, what I would do this week, I'd follow Nick Sirianni around and hopefully he went into a store and bought lottery tickets because then I'd get in line <laughs> behind him because I got a better chance to win because we know he's not winning. Uh, so I just <laughs> grab me a couple dollars of lottery tickets. Um, organized practices against the Jets this week. We were told by guys like you guys who were down there watching every single snap, the Eagles got the better both of the two days against the Patriots, and they got beat 35 to nothing. <laughs> what, 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 what do we read into the practices against the Jets this week before the game on Friday next week? I think you read more how much these veterans play. They got all the guys that were out. Do they come back? And, and, and guys like week to week, I want to see if Davion Taylor is healthy enough to play because – I think another roster spot like Patrick Johnson's comes out there. I just think you just want to see them come back and not look listless and they hold their own, especially against the Jets, because uh, you see the well, Jets have pieces. Careful. But I don't be one. careful. Oh, That's but... Jody's team, Chris. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jody. I just see yeah, get the one and oh. Just like remember that. <laughs> <laughs> You're undefeated right now. <laughs> I I just look at I see some of the things right now, just like uh, I think they have a nice base to build on. He's trying to be nice now. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have my questions about Zach Wilson personally, but in the long term, but that's a whole other thing. He's going to be okay. It's just Fields is going to be better. They're going to yeah. hear about that for the next decade. <laughs> the Fields is the better player, but Wilson's yeah. going to be all right. Yeah. And then uh, I just, I think they just want to, they have to hold their own and not stink up the joint. I think that's the biggest thing. And it's sad it's coming down to that point, but I think the team, the Eagles are a little bit better than ahead of the Jets, I think, overall roster, roster wise, but not that much. Nothing that goes like, oh, well, this should come in there and win every rep and win everything. I don't think they're nowhere near that. But it should be one where they have three instances, both joint practices and the game, where you go, huh, all right, cool. You can see that they are that they're a better roster in that one too. But it, it's they can't go in there sticking it up the joint 
all three times, even two or three times, because I think they're going to have red, extreme red flags. And I, I love where yeah. we are in week three, week three of the preseason. Go in there and don't stink up the. <laughs> That's where we are with the Philadelphia. Eagles. Facts. <laughs> so Unfort- facts. Unfortunately, true. All right, I got one very important lo- question left for you, Chris, uh, from a guy who's only been doing radio for thirty three years. Have you ever been a DJ? No. You Never got a have. phenomenal voice. I don't know oh, if, I you, if you can sing rhythm and blues either, but uh, you sound like a guy who could cue up a Marvin Gaye song and lead into it like nobody's business. Oh, well, we're uh, it's now about <laughs> twenty nine minutes after the hour. We're going to have I'm Marvin Gaye. Oh, there we great. go. There we go. We got your side gig, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. you got Thank a phenomenal you. voice, brother, and we appreciate you sharing it with us here on Birds 365. <laughs> we'll get back to you in a couple of weeks. By then, the Eagles will be 2-0, and oh, and we're going to completely, we're going to go back and erase all the YouTube tapes where the three of us sat here and go, yeah, don't go in there and completely screw it up. We'll, we we'll burn wrong. these tapes down the road when the Eagles win their first two games, or so we hope. <laughs> Great, great stuff. Thanks, buddy. Thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris, Chris Franklin from NJ.com. Doesn't he have a great voice? Yeah, I wish I had his voice. voice. Yeah, I, I, so do I. I'd say my buddy Mike Gill, he's got that deep voice as well. I need, you know, you're on you're on you're on the radio much more than me, but I'm on the radio too. And yeah, I just don't have that big powerful voice. I'd love to I'd love to have it. But Chris is, what can you Chris, do? Chris has got, as we say in the business, great pipes. He really yeah. does. Uh, We'll we'll come back here with the two mediocre pipes guys, McDonald and McMullen. We still got half an hour to break down what happened to the Eagles last night. We could probably do it in about two or three minutes, but we'll get a full half hour analysis still to come your way here on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say But as I always say It's okay to be afraid As long as you face the fear And keep moving forward Wherever you are in life Count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years Independence Blue Cross Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky Is so enjoyable at any time of the day As long as you can find it Here's what we suggest Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com.
He is John McBowen. I am Jody McDonald. We are your Bird Three Sixty Five Mac and Mac guys. We'll rock with you for another twenty five minutes here. Um, J Mac, I, I I mentioned him in passing. John Clark, who's a friend of the program, and uh, I asked him to come on today. As a matter of fact, he said, I would love to. He had a charity thing to do. He couldn't do it. We'll try and get him on next week. And uh, more power to him. After the game was over and the thirty five nothing score had been registered. Johnny Clark did what all you guys try and do. Find the positive. Searching and searching and searching and searching. He came up with a couple that Devonta Smith got separation. Yeah, mm. I, got, I got that one. Trying to move <laughs> past the, the, the drop balls real quickly and straight ahead sure. to Devontae got separation. Uh, so he put as good a spin on it as possible. And I got to give our bud, Ross Tucker, who was on with us yesterday prior to doing the game. I get, he's calling a game and it's 35 to nothing and he's finding positives and I'm going, you're a better man than me, Gunga Din, because I, I'm yeah. very, very uh, hard pressed to find the positives in this game. Some of those guys are really good at it, John. I'm sorry. I've just never been. I call no, a spade gonna, a spade. Yeah. When when you get your tails kicked, I'm going to say you got your tails kicked. I'm not going to find the silver lining in the cloud. More power to, to Johnny Happy and uh, Johnny Sunshine and uh, Ross Tucker because they found positive in last night's game. Well, remember, I mean, they also, you know, Ross is working for the Eagles. So, you know, Merrill Reese the same way. Obviously, you got to spin things in a positive way. So, and and even John Clark, obviously, is, you know, they're a partner uh, with the Eagles preseason. But, and and John is, you know, Johnny Airport, Johnny Sunshine. John's just a happy guy in general. Yep. But um, still, he's going to look at the positive way of life. Where you have the more cynical people like myself or, you know, and Jody Mack as well. Yeah, I mean, you can't put a spin on other than what I tried to do that it's a preseason game. It doesn't matter. Nobody wants to. I mean, look, we joke about it. And we talk about Nick Sirianni's competition. I've said back and forth, it's a little bit overblown. But I mean, this is it, one of his core convictions he talks about all the time. And you're going out there in a competitive environment over six quarters and you're down 52 to nothing. I mean, you can't preach competitiveness and go out there and lay down like that. Um, so it's tough to come up with positives. And um, yes, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Uh, we'll all forget about this by next week, never mind, you know, week one of the season. Uh, nothing ever matters in the preseason other than getting out healthy, which the Eagles weren't able to do with Jason Kroom and Kayvon Wallace. Uh, Jason, much more serious injury than Kayvon, but um, that's the main goal. But again, you can't preach. You can't do that. You can't preach competition, competition, competition. We're competing every moment of every day. Tether ball, ping pong, this, that, rock, paper, scissors. And then you go out with the lights on and say, oh, it doesn't matter. We're not going to compete. You got to try. You got to go out there. And 52 nothing. as I said, it's 52 nothing. Spin that in a positive fashion. Somebody, no. spin it in a positive fashion. He never said we're not going to compete. He said we're not going to show our hand. Oh, they don't know what we're going to do yet. They well, haven't, yeah, we yeah. haven't put it in place yet what we're going to be able to do when the regular season starts. I'm glad you got it under deep cover, Nick, because it is deep, deep, deep cover because it hasn't been real impressive during the uh, actual playing of the preseason games. And let me apologize again in advance for the Eagle fans who want to look at things through Eagle-colored glasses. I got one guy I got to point out because Derek Gunn, who was on with us in hour number one, I thought made a very good point. The Eagles have a lot of young guys. This is a transition year. They had 10 draft picks this year, John. Did you yeah, state that yeah. the other day? Uh, last couple of years, only five this year. They had extra draft picks. So you got a whole bunch of young guys here. And you cut slack to the rookies because they've never been to an entire se- an entire training camp, then an entire season. So we'll cut the, the rookie guys a whole bunch of slack. Matt Pryor's been here a while. And I know that Matt Pryor's claim to fame is his flexibility, that he can play a bunch of different positions along the offensive line. So let me get this straight. Matt Pryor can get beat at tackle, guard, center, right side, left side. 
that's a good thing that he's flexible enough to get beat on both sides of the ball at every time. He got abused about four or five times last night. I get on the quarterbacks because I'm a simpleton <sighs> and it all comes down to the quarterbacks. They got to make the play. They got to make the throw. They got to get the yards. But if they don't have time, shoot, last year I used to defend Carson Wentz for the first month and a half of the season going, he's got no time. The offensive line is in shreds. Where's Lane Johnson? Where's Brooks? How can you put this on Carson? And the more they played, the more I realized you could put it on Carson. But last night, Flacco and uh, Nick Mullins were under pressure way too many times. And a guy like Matt Pryor, who's been there, done that, was getting beat left and right. Is this guy going to make this team, John? I, I can't see it. I, I don't think so. I thought uh, for a while that the Eagles would try to spin him off, probably for a seventh-round pick. And, um, you know, I'm I'm starting to wonder if they can even get that for him. You know, but again, I talk about where you're shaking your head, and I get why. I mean, there's so many offensive line deficient teams I talk about it all the time. I mean, there are teams so much worse off than the Eagles. You know, Miami is a perfect example. They're bringing in Greg Little. They're trying everything to try to get something on the offensive line. There's always people trying to find offensive linemen. And Matt's played a little bit. Look at how much money Halapulavati Baitai got on the open market as a free agent just for being a competent backup. And sometimes he wasn't even that. Uh, that's how desperate teams are in the NFL to find offensive linemen. I, I do think... You know, this team has a lot of depth on the offensive line. I know you asked, uh, what is the, you asked Chris, what, what's the position with the greatest depth? I, I would say offensive line. But when I say that, people over, you know, overrated. I mean, we saw last year, Nate Herbig did a great job for getting thrown into the deep end of the pool last year. Jack Driscoll did a nice job for getting thrown into the deep end of the pool. Matt Pryor's played competently at times, and this is better than other teams when you compare it. But it isn't good when you compare it to Lane Johnson and Brandon Brooks and even Isaac Sayamalo and, and obviously Jason Kelsey. It, it's still not good. It's just better than everybody else. And, yeah, I mean, that's where the – and now you have Brett Toth to enter into that mix because I think he's been one of the – little bright spots on the second and third unit. And and I'm saying he might be better than Matt Pryor. So the Eagles have done a good job uh, building up some of these young players as backup players on the offensive line. But, oh, make no mistake, there is a huge drop-off. And you lived it in real time last year. So for all the hype of the Herg Herbigs and Driscolls of the world, you want Lane Johnson and Brandon Brooks out there at all costs. And that's why things will be better when they're playing a full game. But here's the second part, Jody. I, I, I haven't even gotten to this, and I should have gotten to this much earlier. You know, you're, you're practicing 70 minutes, which, again, I don't even know if 75 minutes, I don't even know if that's Nick Sirianni's fault. I put that in quotations. I think it's an organizational decision, and I think it's thrust upon him. But you're doing all this. You're doing all this. Nobody's getting reps in the, in the preseason. And then, bang, week one shows up, and he's like, go play 65 plays. Go play 70 plays. Are these guys going to get gassed early in the season? Oh, can I answer that question? Yeah. Did you see Alex Singleton tapping his helmet last night? He wanted the hell off the field. He yeah. was the only guy making plays. He was actually making tackles, and it's the preseason, and he's going, I need out. I need out. Yeah. So you're asking me, can they get gassed? I watched Alex Singleton get gassed last yeah, night. And Alex you bet your bottom in, dollar they can get gassed. Yeah, and Alex is in good shape. He's not, you know, he's not one of those guys you would think that would get gassed. But if you're not playing 65, 70 reps and you're not playing at all, and Alex is one of those guys who played, you know, at least a little bit. Um, and then again, we fast forward to week one, go out and play the whole game. I, I don't. I, I don't get this again. I don't get the plan. The plan is uh, somewhat shaky. I would agree with you there. And uh, you mentioned where I asked about the depth uh, when I asked Chris. I just specifically asked about the defensive side. I didn't oh, ask okay. about the offensive okay. side. So that's why yeah. I would agree with you that the offensive line might be an area of depth. 
but I think that's even overstated because they had to play last year. Yeah, they played, and yeah, they went four and eleven. So let's nice yeah, exactly. get that participation trophy big, because it, they yeah, were, it was still it was still a huge drop off from correct. from what it was. So yeah, I just think yeah. I didn't hear you say defense, just uh, couch just, it in that I, I just asked about the defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, D-line, uh, linebackers, se- uh, secondary, which would be the one that you would be least worried about if they had some specific injuries. Um, yeah, and but- then I would say the defensive line. From that perspective, I would agree. The defensive line is probably the deepest group on, on that side of the football, and that's what the Eagles believe in. So they build on the, the defensive line and offensive line. But yeah, I mean, and 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 I I know people have said this before, and you know, sep- September's the new August in the NFL, and you know, a lot of times those first two, three regular season games are like the preseason games, and guys are from a chemistry standpoint are are getting up to speed, and they can be ugly, and they could be certainly non aesthetic, and uh, yeah, guys are going to get gassed, and I think. You know, and think about if you're having one of those games where, you know, one side of the football is maybe performing than better than the other side of the football, and that group has to be out there for 80 plays maybe because it's a little bit disjointed. Uh, I I don't. You better get ready to rotate Nick Sirianni and Jonathan Gaden. Yeah. Oh, by the way, from the uh, Jody McDonald advice on the wagering last night, hypothetical wagering, I took it in the shorts. Uh, I thought the Eagles were going to win because they won the two days. Wait, wait, Ed Kratz and I actually joked about that. We were saying the Patriots are going to beat the number by themselves. And by the way, if they had a kicker, they would have beat the number Correct. by themselves. The And you know what was funny, John? Uh, again, I hopped on uh, VegasInsider.com before the game started. The Eagles I gave you yesterday, the Eagles were a favorite in the game. Oh, no, excuse me. The Patriots were a favorite in the game. They were a point and a half favorite. By kickoff, the Eagles had actually become the favorite. They were a point favorite going into the game. Now, this was before Jalen Hurts was pulled and nobody knew about that. But the pendulum had swung enough from Patriot favoritism to Eagles favoritism. So with my prediction of a 2020 tie, I would have taken the uh, Patriots plus a point because I thought it was going to be 2020. Uh, the 40 on the over-under, it was 38 and a half. I thought it was going to be 40. Loser. And the other one that you suggested, Jody, do some research. See if you can find that out. The uh, uh, Marlon Tua Pelota uh, wager that he was going yeah, to get yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. he was going to get a, 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 fo- a fumble, a uh, tackle, no, a sack, a tackle for loss, and a deflected pass. He got none of those three. Took the 0 for 3 on that one. He didn't even get a tackle. He got an assist. He got one assist, and he played a bunch because they were down to their third string basically for the entire second half. He's the sixth-round draft pick. I know we talk about this all the time on the show, and some people are probably tired of it, but I think it's very important how much emphasis is put on who was drafted, who wasn't drafted, the difference between a first-round pick and a second-round pick, a second and a third, and a third and fourth. I know he's a sixth-round pick. He does not look like he's an NFL lineman. Though. No, he's not making this team. And it, he, he'll be on the practice squad for that reason. Uh, because he How many on the practice squad again this year? I know it's expanded. 16. 16. Okay. So. Um, so plenty of room. And, yeah, they'll stash him on the practice squad, hope to get him stronger, year in the weight room, that type of thing, because he's getting pushed around. But that happens a lot with young players. And, you know, a redshirt year is often good. Usually we talk about offensive linemen uh, more so than any other position. they got to get stronger. Uh, But also the interior on the defensive line, and that's what Marlon plays. Those guys generally, you know, they they're playing with grown men who just spend their entire lives in the weight room and they're and they're you know they're working out to get stronger not to look like a bodybuilder so you get these big offensive linemen in the NFL who are grown man strength so to speak they push around those young kids and that's what that's what Marlin is going through right now maybe it clicks for him maybe he gets stronger it's been Andre Dillard's problem Andre's got to get stronger he said he did. He was in the weight room. 
hasn't manifested itself. We'll see in that direction. I see a lot of the same problems with Marlon. Um, yeah, he's not going to make this team. I mean, there's just no way. He is John McMullen. I'm Jody McDonald. We're your Mac and Mac guys. When we come back, I'm going to run something by my partner that uh, he probably isn't going to know. I know I don't know, but <laughs> I may give him an idea for a column on one of his two spots. All right. I need that. Or, too or much. Holy voice. I write uh, too much. Something to check out. I, hey, that's what I'm here for, to make my partner's life easier. Uh, and yours as well. Appreciate you tuning in to Birds 365. We'll come back, put a bow on the show. Stay right here. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Coming down the home stretch of a Football Friday Birds 365 episode. McDonald and McMullen with you after a 35 to nothing thrashing by the Patriots. Yeah, it doesn't count. Yeah, it's preseason. Yeah, it's not going to affect the standing at all. But I'm sorry, it still was kind of a painful watch last night. Um, JM, I want to run this one by you. And uh, I don't expect you to answer this off the top of your head because I will readily admit I sure as hell can't answer it off the top of my head. But just give me a guesstimate number. And then if you want to do the research and put this as a nugget in one of your columns, feel free to go ahead. How many players do you think there are in the National Football League right now on the 31 other teams, other than, of course, the Philadelphia Eagles, that are starters that were once Philadelphia Eagles? Now, when Hmm. I say that, I'm specifically talking about guys that the Eagles cut. 
if Deshaun Jackson is going to start for the, the Los Angeles Rams, that doesn't really matter to me. He was an Eagle. He went free agent. He changed teams. He came back. And now he's changing teams again. So that's not the kind of guy I'm talking about. I'm talking about where Eagle draftees or Eagle signees, undrafted guys who they brought in, then they cut and went to become significant contributors for somebody else. I'm not coming up with any off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a handful of them out there. It's not that big a number, is it? No. Cut, I mean, I think people look at Sidney Jones and Rasul Douglas. They had some success. I don't know where Sidney is with Jacksonville right now. He got hurt again. He made some plays. Rasul Douglas made some plays early in the season in Carolina. He's in... Las Vegas, but he's not a starter. Eric Rowe was, nah, I, I don't even know if you count him. He he had started at a certain point. Um, Not many, if no. any. I mean, free agents leave, as you mentioned. I mentioned my tie, got a big contract. Jalen Mills is yeah, not even Nelson Aguilar, obviously, but those are guys that were either, you know, moved on just from a free agency standpoint not not a lot, which means, you know, which isn't good either. I mean, uh, it, it's never good to cut a player and have him come back to to turn into a good player from a perspective. Fans get really upset about that. I mean, when Sidney Jones had a couple of interceptions, they went, oh, look, Sidney Jones, and then it comes back down to earth. Same thing with Rasul. Um, yeah, I mean, if you cut a guy, you usually cut a guy for a reason. Now, there's examples of the light switch. Probably the most notable would be Buddy Ryan way back in the day with Chris Carter, but that had to do with off the field stuff. And Chris had some self admitted, so I can say, a drug issues yep. at the time. Uh, and that's why he was just phenomenally talented. And, you know, people killed Buddy, Buddy Ryan for years about that. And Chris Carter thanked him because Buddy wouldn't tell the truth. He tried oh, yeah. to protect the kid. Did I, um, did I ever tell you I met Chris Carter in a bar in New York and he told me that Buddy Ryan might be one of his favorite people on yeah, earth because yeah, he, he got him scared him. straight yeah, and became yeah. the kind of player. I just happened to be in a bar in New York City yeah, and Chris Carter yeah. came in. I went over and introduced myself. Yeah, we just tremendous. started shooting the breeze about Buddy Ryan. Because Chris was kind of a a-hole back then and he, he was saying some bad things and Buddy was trying to help him and saying, look, it's not going to work here. You got to you got to go get your life together, um, and as you mentioned, scared him straight and never told the truth. Never said he just, you know, that old quote. He only catches touchdowns. Everybody made fun of Buddy Ryan for years and years and years and years, and then Chris Carter finally told the truth and said, "Look, this guy pretty much He's saved my career. Yep. Yeah, covering for me, uh, made sure another team would take at least a chance on me uh, by not telling them." how, you know, derailed my personal life was. So, you know, that kind of stuff is really rare. And, yeah, it hasn't happened. But, you know, <clears throat> one of the things with Harry Roseman people criticize, because we talk about him as a general manager, and I always say he's really good at the sort of outside-the-line stuff, figuring out leverage, value, creating value. <clears throat> personnel, though, that's what it comes down to, picking the right players, picking the right players. We got two consecutive first-round picks, Jody, not Devontae Smith before, Andre Dillard, Jalen Rager. Oof, not good so far. Hopefully they can turn it around. Agreed. And the reason I brought up about the, if you cut them and they become a uh, contributor slash starter somewhere else, it's one of those good news, bad news things. It means that your immediate evaluation, your – First evaluation was probably right. Then you liked the guy enough. You thought he could be an NFL player. But then your second <laughs> evaluation, where you let him go, was wrong. Well, which is a glass half empty or glass half full? Do you give him credit for going, hey, no, he knew he was a starter. But do you take all that credit or even all that credit and more away when the guy goes on to become a player for somebody else? I guess the negative outweighs the positive in that one. Uh, and why shouldn't it be on this day that the Eagles lost? 35 to nothing that we point out something that's more negative yeah. than positive. I, I always say, when you talk about first round picks, Jody, all of them, not just in Philadelphia, everywhere, they generally don't fail because they don't have the talent to be in the NFL. They fail for other reasons. 
what are going to be the reasons for Andre Dillard and uh, not not? Well, that's enough? what you know. You talked about. You can talk about every. We just talked about Chris Carter. Could be off the field issues. Not that's not Andre. Um, in Andre's case, you know, people have talked to his mindset, his work ethic, his ability to fight through. It could be as simple as just not. You know, a lot of guys. You, you, a lot of guys play football because they couldn't play basketball. Guys thought love a ball, love of the game. It's a grind. You get that big paycheck and you say, okay, I made it. And then it stops. And so it's never about, you don't have that baseline of talent. It's always about something else. It could be off the field, could be work ethic, could be mindset, could be a hundred different things. It's never about talent. <laughs> All right, Johnny Mac, last question. Are you going to be spending quality time on the Jersey Turnpike this upcoming week? No, oh, yes, unfortunately. Uh, you're, you're, you're going up for both practices uh, at yes, Florham Park? Yes. All right. And right. the game. You're Three talking times. to a guy who you're talking to a guy who went up and down the Jersey Turnpike uh, 200 times know, a yeah, year uh, for many a year, my friend. I know. So you're, if you're I looking know. for sympathy, you're looking to the wrong partner. I, I, I got a lot of respect that. for you because that is a brutal. I'm already dreading it. <laughs> well, uh, but not. I am looking forward to Saturday night. So, I have so wait a minute. Ready. Are we going to get you on it all next week on those two days? Or Tuesday is that... and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday, probably not. Those are going to be Jeff Kerr days. I'm going to be. I'm going to. I'm going to be in the car on the turnpike. Uh, Monday, I'll be here. Thursday, I'll be here. And Friday, I should be here because the game's at night. Gotcha. So. All right. So uh, you think uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, we'll at least be able to get you on in the car at the top of the show. Uh, you, you can talk to us while navigating the journey. So what? You're going to be in traffic between yeah, Mount Ephraim and wherever else. That's, uh, that's up to uh, that's up to uh, Joe Kraus and Xander. And if they want the uh, the poor Nick Fierro type audio. <laughs> <laughs> we, we always just uh, put up the, the ph phenomenal picture we yeah. have of you and just have you on the phone. All right, uh, we'll do that. Monday, you're here, though. It's you and me Monday. Yes, yes. Done deal. Uh, Monday, we'll get here before you know it. Uh, looking forward to talking to you guys again next week, last week of preseason, before we start the 2021 year here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube.